Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rachel Alvarez, Director of Operations for CureCMD. Thanks so much for attending today's webinar. This is Ask the Expert, questions submitted by the Step In One community. The format for today's webinar will include answers to questions submitted by the community. CureCMD is planning the CMD Scientific and Family Conference July 7th through 9th in Arlington, Virginia. This is another really great opportunity for you to ask questions and learn from experts in our disorder, as well as meet other affected individuals and their families affected by CMD. We hope to see you there. And I will now introduce our host for today's webinar. Dr. Anna Ferrero, Dr. Johannes Dastiger, Dr. Hank Meyer, Dr. Alan Beggs, Dr. Behezad Mugidas Zadi and Dr. Gustavo diaz Chaposki and myself from CMD. So first we'd like to cover some basic information about step in one and address the community question about calcium leak. Uh, sure, hi, this is Alan Beggs and uh, Bezad, do you want to speak up? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, this is Bezad Mogadas Um So this is a pretty complicated slide showing a bunch of structures in skeletal muscle. And a lot of the structures here are uh, representing proteins that we know are defective in various forms of muscle of neuromuscular disease, in particular uh, congenital myopathies and muscular dystrophies. So starting at the outside of the muscle cell, there's a label at the top uh, for collagen. And uh, the collagens are part of what's called the extracellular matrix, the material outside the muscle cell. Uh, and this helps maintain all the muscle fibers in connection with each other. Uh, and there are forms of muscular dystrophy uh, due to collagen mutations or defects in this extracellular matrix. Next, in the upper left-hand corner, there's a series of pink and uh, yellow uh, globes uh, labeled the sarcoglycans and dystroglycans. This is a group of proteins that span across the muscle membrane, which is the blue structure you see going from left to right along the top. And these help maintain a connection between the outside of the muscle and the inside and help ensure that the muscle membrane maintains its strength and integrity. Further down on the inside, just below the dystroglycans and sarcoglycans, you'll see dystrophin. Um, dystrophin is the protein that is defective in boys who have Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy. Together with the sarcoglycans, it's very important for maintaining the strength and integrity of the blue membrane. And so when any of these proteins are missing, what happens is the membrane tends to break down and then uh, the muscle cell eventually dies. So these forms of muscular dystrophy then are not really a defect in how the muscle contracts, but rather they're a defect in the way that the muscle maintains its structure and integrity. If you look below in the lower right-hand corner, there's a structure we call a sarcomere. And, and um, Naz is uh, showing uh, right now the structure. You'll see uh, flanking on either side, there's a protein called alpha-actinin, which forms the so-called Z-line. And a sarcomere is the unit from one Z-line to the next. You'll see in the next slide, in a few minutes in the animation, how this muscle actually contracts. So what triggers the muscle to contract? In the slide, you'll see in just a minute, it's caused by calcium coming out of the circular blue structures shown at the top right. These are the so-called sarcoplasmic reticulum. You'll see the little green circles this Ca plus plus or calcium, these are calcium ions which trigger the muscle contraction. The way the calcium ions come in and out of the muscle are through a couple of channels. One of these channels is called RYR, or the ryanidine receptor, and the other channel is called CIRCA, S-E-R-C-A. So with that introduction, let's move on to the next slide, which I believe will be an animation run off another computer and Bezad will walk you through that and explain what step N1 is and how it controls this function called contraction. 
Sure. Okay. This is based on Mogadas Ade. Um, can you play the animation? Can yes. So this is a simpler uh, uh, picture of uh, the diagram that Alan Beggs uh, explained to you. So on the top, the blue sarcolemma, that's the muscle membrane. And when the muscle is activated by a neuron, the action potential travels through the membrane and activates the DHPR channel. The DHPR channel can activate the RYR channel located at the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this will cause a, a massive release of calcium through the RYR channel into the cytosol. And in the presence of this uh, calcium in the cytosol, the myosin uh, chains can slide uh, over the, the actin uh, filaments. And we get the shortening of the sarcomere. This is the how the contraction happens. And this event of uh, uh, muscle excitation and the contraction caused by calcium release is called the uh, uh, excitation contraction coupling. So you can see uh, also, uh, you can point uh, to the CEPN1 and CERCA. CEPN1 is, uh, has been shown to interact directly with the CERCA uh, channels. And seven can uh, uh, maintain circa in its active reduced form. Arrow one, that's the other protein in red, is another protein that uh, produces a more oxidizing environment in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which tends to inhibit circa. So normally, uh, seven one and arrow one can uh, counterbalance each other, but in the absence of seven one, the Overoxidizing environment caused by ARO1 can inhibit CERCA, and as a result, there is less calcium that is uh, being uh, uh, getting back to sarcoplasmic reticulum. I'll just quickly put this in context, especially for the folks, who, um, hopefully everybody on this call who will be joining us in Washington, um, and say that um, for a number of years now, we have thought that selenoprotein N or CEPN encoded by the CEPN1 gene was responsible for somehow modulating or controlling the calcium coming out. Um, what's been a very exciting and important advance in just the past few years is our understanding for how that happened. Uh, and essentially, uh, as Bezad just described, what we now understand is that CEPN1 is a partner protein together with this other protein called ERO1, E-R-O-1. And together, they control the CERCA channel, which is responsible for drawing the calcium back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So I understand one of the questions was uh, that articles often refer to calcium leak every time the muscle contracts. And so what exactly does that mean? Well, if you look at this diagram, in the absence of contraction, there's a certain amount of calcium inside the muscle cell, and that's illustrated by the circular flow of calcium coming out of the RYR channel and going right back into the circa. So when a muscle is resting or not contracting, there's a certain amount of calcium that you can call it perhaps leaking or just maybe being maintained in the body of the muscle fiber, and this is normal. In disease states, sometimes caused by either a mutation in the ryanidine receptor, RYR, or um, in this case, um, well, in particular, caused by mutations in RYR, those channels can become leaky, and in the stimulation from a nerve, the RYR will leak too much calcium out into the body of the muscle fiber, and then it's as though it's always being charged to contract, and it, it gets fatigued and doesn't contract properly. So there is a certain amount of calcium leak that's normal to maintain normal amounts of calcium when a muscle is not contracting. And then there is a, are disease states where uh, abnormalities of, for example, the RYR channel lead to too much calcium all the time within the muscle. Uh, and what we're discovering now and starting to learn more about is how CEPN1 controls the activity of CERCA to help maintain the proper level of calcium within the muscle and to draw that calcium back up during the relaxation phase so the muscle can be recharged and ready to contract again. How does excess calcium in the cytoplasm cause damage? That's a great question. Uh, so in fact, calcium levels can do lots of things in, to cells. And 
essentially cells are designed to have just the right amount and not too much. And so, for example, one reason why for in Duchenne dystrophy that the muscle actually dies is that too much calcium can come into the cell from the outside when the blue membrane breaks down. In, since the contraction is closely controlled by the amount of calcium, if you don't have enough, then you don't get proper contraction. If you have too much, then the contractile machinery gets overloaded. And there are other proteins in the cell responsible for cell death that get activated. Um, so then is the normal level of calcium in the cytoplasm responsible for what we call muscle tone? Um, and I would say um, yes. Um, actually, that's an area that NAS or um, maybe Anna Ferraro, she has been able to call back in, could answer better. Actually, the normal level of calcium in the cytoplasm is maintained within quite narrow limits. So uh, under the normal, what we call physiological levels, which is a quite very well defined amount of calcium, then the, the normal muscle tone is maintained. If this uh, normal window is changed because there's less calcium in the cytosol or there's more calcium in the cytosol, then you will have problems with muscle uh, tone and with uh, muscle response to uh, contraction signals. So uh, typically the disease is present from birth or from the first months of life. The first symptom or sign that most families recall retrospectively is that affected children were not able to hold their head at the age of three months, which is the standard age. But uh, this can go unnoticed because uh, babies typically are uh, able to walk at an age which is close to normal, sometimes a bit later, but typically between the age of 12 and 18 months. And um, not all of them, but many of them are quite good walkers. So the disease can go unnoticed. Typically, patients are poor runners. They may complain of fatigue. Uh, they are uh, not good at sports. But in many cases, the, the first referral to hospital is around the age, between the age of 5 and 10 because uh, they cannot put on weight, they are uh, very thin, or because they complain of fatigue, or because they have very small, very thin muscles. And uh, typically the muscles that are more, that are weaker, are those that control the neck, the flexion of the neck, and also those that control position of the spine, what we call the paravertebral muscles, and also the muscles that are in the thorax, so that help the breathing function. So uh, around the age of 10, in between 9 and 10 as a mean, um, in most cases we see that um, uh, they develop scoliosis, which is a deformation of the spine. Uh, many of them, most of them by this age, already have respiratory difficulties, which are more important when they are uh, lying on, on their backs because the diaphragm is weak. Um, and this is uh, therefore more important during the night and typically needs assisted ventilation. Uh, and when they are put under assisted ventilation, in most cases, there is a stabilization of the respiratory function, but a scoliosis uh, is usually progressive, so uh, requires braces, and in, in the majority of patients, also uh, a surgical correction of the, of the deformity. When this is successful and under good respiratory care and uh, after a good uh, surgery of the spine, there is a period of stability. Uh, the typical 7-1 patient is able to walk in, the, in his teens and in early adulthood uh, quite long distances. Most of them have active lives and um, are pretty independent and autonomous in their everyday life. And then what we are learning now is that around the age of 30 or 35, the effect of muscle aging overlaps with the effect and adds to the effect of the disease. So we can see some degree of uh, progression of disease after the age of 35. 
but what is more uh, typical in this disease is that the neck and trunk muscles are weaker than the limb muscles and therefore the respiratory function and the uh, uh, is severely affected and uh, uh, scoliosis can be also a, a major issue uh, with care of the disease. Now, did you have anything to add? So uh, I was just going to respond to Ellen's question over text, but I think, and maybe Dr. Ferro can respond to this as well, the relationship of the disease with low weight, I think that uh, part of it is probably due to like early undiagnosed respiratory failure. And uh, in theory, once you start treating that, some people do gain a little bit of weight. But other than that, I'm not exactly sure why the weight is pretty low in the majority of patients. Well, that, that's one of the reasons, definitely, because uh, unchecked and untreated respiratory failure leads to anorexia, low, low appetite, and, and low food intake. But it's probably not the only reason, because even in patients who are properly ventilated, we tend to see this failure to thrive and, and very, very low weight even in adulthood. So it's one of the factors, but probably not the only one. I know in collagen six disorders, we sometimes talked about whether or not there's an increase of brown fat in some of those congenital myopathies, and that has a higher metabolic out output, I think, in some, you know, you would think that if you could do a study on brown fat versus white fat, uh, maybe that would explain some of the reasons why some patients with myopathies are thinner than others. But again, this is all just a guess. Hmm. Yeah, so we're trying to look into the metabolic side of things, actually. A step in one, a spectrum disorder, and what does that mean? And that also addresses Ted's question about why some people present as children versus adults. It's a spectrum disorder from the histological point of view. When we take biopsies from the patients, uh, and we look them under the microscope, we can see different lesions. And that is why some patients had an initial diagnosis after the biopsy of multiminicor disease, and others had a diagnosis of congenital muscular dystrophy, and others of congenital fiber type disproportion. So the, 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 the histological, the microscopic aspect of the lesions that we see in SEP and one patient muscles um, is quite variable, but actually when we look at the patients, they, uh, they are quite recognizable, and one sepan one patient looks very much like another sepan one patient, independently of the initial diagnosis. And this is so true that we now, in many patients, go for the genetic diagnosis when we see the patients in the consultation without doing a muscle biopsy. So, I would say from the clinical point of view, it is one recognizable disorder. It's not more a spectrum of disorder than, say, central core disease or any other congenital myopathy. But there is a high uh, variability of the microscopic lesions. From the clinical point of view, that is from the symptoms and signs that patients um, notice and that we see. Um, I would say it's one definite condition. And then we have patients which have a more severe form of the disease and other patients who have a milder form of the disease. But again, this is true for any disease and in any case for any myopathy. This is Alan. Depending, depending on the nature of the genetic change or mutation, um, some of the changes completely eliminate all the function of the selenium protein and protein. Um, so when you have zero protein function, then you might be expected to have a somewhat more con di severe disease. Other changes, so-called missense changes, might alter the shape of the protein and partially destroy its function. And so that might lead to a milder clinical presentation. So this is a... a a generalization, and there are exceptions, um, but largely what we find with a lot of genetic conditions is that as a general rule of thumb, mutations that destroy a protein completely tend to lead to a more severe picture, whereas those that alter it somewhat have a milder presentation. As uh, Dr. Ferraro just said, uh, the condition when you see it clinically is fairly recognizable. And 
the unifying feature from the perspective of a geneticist is that it's all caused by an abnormality in the selenoprotein N, which we showed a few minutes ago. So when we're thinking about trying to develop treatments, it's important if that treatment is going to be attacking the absence of that protein, then we want all the patients to want to know that they all have the same genetic condition. Getting back to what we see under the microscope, that's really a secondary effect. So whether or not you have a diagnosis of congenital fiber type disproportion or rigid spine muscular dystrophy or mini core myopathy, that's all based on the way the muscle looks under the microscope, which is your muscle's response to the absence of selenoprotein N. But the unifying feature and the thing that kind of groups everybody together is the same underlying absence, and that's really what's important. So it's appropriate to say that you may have one or the other of these, the FTD, rigid spine, mini core. That does denote how your muscles look. But when we're thinking about treatments and trying to understand prognosis, it's very helpful to group everybody together in, under the same genetic rubric. Do we have any idea why muscle biopsy results vary from one person to another? The, the general hand-waving answer is that um, there are secondary changes. There are, might be differences in the age or the particular muscle that's looked at or the stage of a disease condition, whether somebody it's a very early in the, in the, in the course or late. Um, it might also be due to secondary genetic effects, depending on what other genes you have. Your muscle might respond slightly differently. It might also be due to your environment, whether you've been exercising a lot lately or whether you, your diet. These are all things we really don't know the answers to. Um, and uh, it's something that there's a lot of interest in. In some cases, the type of the mutation might lead to muscle that's more likely to look one way or another as well but we just ha simply haven't had enough experience looking at enough cases to come up with definitive answers. Yeah, from a muscle imaging standpoint, um, actually cases of RYR1 myopathy look very similar to step one myopathy in that they have sparing of the rectus femoris muscle and uh, more in increased involvement of the sartorius as compared to the gracilis and sparing of the adductor longus. So, Typically, actually, interestingly, so if you were to biopsy from the quad, a lot of people will say, oh, you had a quadricep biopsy, but they don't designate what exactly muscle, what muscle was exactly sampled. And if they sampled the vastus lateralis, that might have more involvement. We don't know exactly why that's the case, but from an imaging standpoint, you see that the vastus lateralis is more involved than the rectus femoris, and that could be reflected in the biopsy findings as well. Yeah, so as the name implies, the quadriceps is really a group of four distinct muscles. And so they can each, each one respond somewhat differently to a particular disease state. Um, so that's a very nice example where depending on where you look, you might see a slightly different answer. Um, but the underlying cause is the same. Yes. If I, and if I can just expand on this to answer to the next question, what is the appropriate term to use in describing the diagnosis, we definitely now uh, use the term step and one related myopathy to which spans all these different histological microscopical presentations of the disease. Yeah, exactly. That's a nice unifying feature. So these other terms are not wrong, and, and they do indicate real differences between uh, people that are important to, for us to know about to try to understand. But the important unifying feature is the genetic basis. And so by using the name of the gene, SUPN1 associated myopathy, which just simply means myo is muscle, pathy is disease, um, it kind of brings everybody together in one unifying diagnosis. Sorry, are we able to now or will we in the future able to correlate genotype and phenotype? There are some, um, there are some data, as Alan mentioned, one of the mutations that we find most often in patients with sepn one uh, related myopathy is a mutation that uh, leads to a total absence of the protein because it is located at the very beginning of the gene in exon 1. And these cases with mutations in exon 1 and total absence of the protein tend to be more severe than patients with other mutations that, the mutations that either spare part of the gene and protein 
or uh, lead to changes in the protein, but not total absence of, of the protein. But this is not um, an absolute true, and we still see patients with protein absence, or at least with half of the protein and the other half with changes that probably alter its function, that have a, a milder phenotype. So. Um, the answer, I guess, is yes, there is a tendency to a genotype-phenotype correlation in which mutations that lead to total protein absence tend to be more severe, but each case is different, and each combination of individual mutations can lead to a different severe, se severity of phenotypes. I should say this is a very active area of research, and um, Anna, Anna and her group are doing some of this, Bezad and my group are doing this. Um, but essentially, uh, we've only been able to identify the mutations in a relatively small number of individuals. So the more people who contribute to research studies allow us to study their genes and then correlate the particular genetic changes with their clinical situation, the better we can understand these relationships and then hopefully predict them um, for people in the future. And the last question on this slide, should we be concerned about onset of contractures? Uh, well, contractures are functionally not the main problem in many SEP and one patients, um, excepting uh, contractions of the spine and paraspinal muscles. Um, if you look for spine, what we call spinal rigidity, that is a difficulty in flexing your neck and flexing your spine, uh, because the muscles that extend the neck and spine are stronger than the flexors and therefore lead to contractures, then it's present from very uh, young ages, uh, from the age of three, four, five. If you look for it on the clinical setting, you can see some degree of, of spinal rigidity. It typically becomes more uh, obvious around the age of 10 uh, in parallel with scoliosis, and it can become a, a functional problem which has an impact also on the respiratory function of patients. Uh, as for contractures of the arms and legs, so limb contractures, they tend to appear in in the uh, in in the in teens or at the end of the first at the end of the first decade of life. But they are less in most patients. They are less um, of a problem from the functional point of view than in other myopathies such as collagen 6 related disorders or merosin myopathy or other forms of congenital muscle disease. Hank Meyer, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist with an interest in neuromuscular disease and I've had the pleasure of working with uh, other patients with FN1 and some other congenital muscular dystrophies. Um, so the first question is, what can we do to prevent breathing muscles from getting weaker? I think that's a, a very good question, and one, uh, you know, one partial answer that we, uh, we've been exploring uh, with our colleagues from Cincinnati is um, if using range of motion therapy uh, can be helpful in preventing contractures um, and preventing stiffness in the muscles and the, uh, the joints that the muscles uh, control within the respiratory system. And at least in collagen-6 myopathy, and in LAMA2 myopathy, uh, the two conditions where we focused our, our uh, endeavors initially, it appears that there is uh, a, um, uh, so some benefit, and uh, we're, we're looking to explore further. And that, that gets to this question that's um, uh, asked a little bit later about air stacking or, or deep breathing. And that has potential both to stretch the respiratory muscles, move the joints of the uh, ribs uh, where they contact the spine, and then maintain aeration or potential use of the uh, uh, the lung tissue itself. And one of the things that happens if you breathe progressively more shallowly is that you have portions of your lungs that you're not using that become what we call atelectatic or collapse. And when that happens, that makes the lung tissue itself stiffer and harder to move. 
And so if you have weak respiratory muscles, uh, beginning, you begin to have stiff joints, and then you have stiff lungs, that uh, is a, um, obviously a, a, a compilation of a bunch of different things that make it um, quite hard to, uh, to breathe effectively. And so I think it's still a little early to say that, um, uh, that well, so it's certainly too early to uh, uh, suggest that um, uh, doing raised volume therapy is uh, standard of care. We're hoping to get to, get to that point, however. Um, the question of diaphragm pacing is um, an interesting one. And the only real conditions where we use diaphragm pacing are conditions where we have phrenic nerve uh, paralysis or dysfunction. Uh, and so I'm not aware of any primary myopathies where um, people are, are using diaphragm pacing. The most common condition is something called uh, congenital central hypoventilation syndrome, which essentially is a long-winded way of saying that your respiratory control center in your brain doesn't send adequate signals to your diaphragm to contract and breathe. Um, and so um, I don't know that uh, that uh, uh, increasing the uh, number of uh, the strength of the signal down the, um, the phrenic nerve would, would be helpful helpful in, um, in myopathy. Uh, can use of the coffices help expand lung capacity, or is it only to be used for, uh, or is it only to be used for preventing respiratory illness? Um, that's uh, is an excellent question, and uh, uh, I guess to this. Uh, you know, question of range of motion therapy for, for the respiratory system. And one of the uh, nice things about the cough assist is that you can set it to deliver um, a breath that would be, uh, from a volume standpoint, well above what, uh, what you would typically be breathing at, uh, at rest. And so that allows you to not only re-expand the lungs and open up areas of atelectasis, but also stretch the muscles of the rib cage, the muscles controlling how the ribs articulate with the spine, um, and then also the abdominal muscles to help maintain flexibility. I, uh, well, I, I imagine that we don't have, and the pressure's delivered, uh, completely convincing data at this point. I, I think there are enough physiologic studies that have addressed portions of this that um, I think on balance make this a, 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 you know, a therapy that I think has a lot of potential benefit, really no significant uh, downside other than having and I, with all of my neuromuscular patients, I'll start um, raised volume therapy fairly early in the process and certainly well before there's a need for routine airway clearance therapy um, using the cough assist. And as the name applies, the, the cough assist is a device. It's the old version is the bottom left device, uh, sort of a gray box. Um, and what it does is it uh, applies a certain pressure to the, uh, the airway, through a mask or through a mouthpiece, or if you have a trach, through a tracheostomy tube. And held for about two to three seconds to allow the air to distribute nicely through the lungs. And then it's cycled to applying negative pressure or suction to help pull the air out. And that, uh, you know, that action of uh, deep inflation and then uh, assisted exhalation uh, at least supports two of the three things that we all do when we cough, which is take a deep breath and then forcefully exhale. Um, the only thing that it can't reproduce is a glottic closure that we have very briefly as we start to exhale. And that gives us a uh, substantial force of exhalation that's about three times the force of what hypothesis can uh, can apply. And I think it's safe to say that mechanical ins insufflation, exufflation, or apophysis therapy is really the hallmark of airway clearance therapy in neuromuscular disease, irrespective of what the, um, uh, what the condition is. And so uh, the middle question, I've heard of something called air stacking. What is it? Should I do it? And why doesn't my pulmonologist recommend it? Well, uh, air stacking is what I'm you know, talking about with doing deep breathing. You can do this using the cough assist, or you can put a mouthpiece with a one-way valve allowing air in but not out um, uh, over the, the top of the, uh, uh, the mask. And what that will do is allow you to take a breath in, and then you take another breath in, another breath in until you can't breathe, any, uh, breathe in any further. And that allows you to, with your own respiratory muscle strength, 
um, breathe up to a lung volume much above that body volume that you're breathing at at rest. Um, this is a perfectly legitimate way of doing range of motion therapy in patients that have relatively well-preserved respiratory muscle function. Um, and so some people will do breath stacking, other people will do use a mechanical device like the hypothesis. The one thing that we do know is that you can attain a higher volume, so more range of motion using a mechanical device like the hypothesis than uh, by doing hair stacking. And so the, the second half of that question, why didn't my pulmonologist recommend it? Well, it's not, has not at this point been adopted as standard of care, and so that's probably the answer. Uh, it's not something that um, is certainly written in any of our uh, respiratory guidelines, though I think people are becoming uh, more aware of it, and they're, some are beginning to integrate it into their, uh, their practice, though I think those of us that, that, that do use it routinely, I think, are in a, a fairly small uh, but proud minority. Um, the, uh, rec uh, do you recommend using the vibrating vest, which is the device at the bottom right? The uh, long name for that is high-frequency chest wall oscillation. And so that, what that blue vest does is it fills up with air, and then those tubes oscillate air going in and out of the vest, uh, creating vibration on the chest. And what that does is that shakes the lungs, and in doing so, shakes the airways. And that vibration will help make mucus in the lungs less viscous, thinner, easier to clear. It also helps to move it towards the central airways. This device is exceptionally effective in a condition called cystic fibrosis, which is the most common genetic condition in Caucasians and causes a recurrent bronchitis and pneumonia. The issue, however, is that in cystic fibrosis, the vast majority of our patients have an effective cough. And so if this device is to be used in patients with neuromuscular disease, it can only be used on its own if you have an effective cough. If you don't, then you need to use another device like the cough assist in addition to the vest so that you can um, get the mucus um, all the way out from the medium to central uh, airways, which is where the vest is effective in mobilizing the mucus too. So having said that, when we have a patient who's using the cough assist, uh, especially patients in the hospital, they need additional help to mobilize secretions from the peripheral portions of the respiratory system um, the vest, and then another device called intrapulmonary percussive ventilation, or IPV, are effective add-on therapies to help with airway clearance. Then the next question is, uh, what are the signs of daytime ventilatory support, uh, that daytime ventilatory support may be needed? Um, I think the general thing that I always look for is uh, progressive fatigue during the day, uh, feeling the need to take a nap, um, or even just sort of nodding off, um, any of the signs that we would all attribute to uh, having had poor sleep. That uh, certainly, if you start to see those during the day, that should um, alert you that something may not be right either at night or even uh, during the daytime. Um, I, I have the benefit of uh, when I see patients in my office um, having a capnograph to measure carbon dioxide level and measuring something called entitled carbon dioxide is a way that we have to see how well the body is getting rid of the carbon dioxide that it produces during normal metabolic function. So uh, uh, outside uh, a physician's office, the simplest way to identify uh, potential daytime ventilatory, you know, uh, sorry, daytime respiratory insufficiency would be um, progressive fatigue out of character with how things have been. Then uh, the next question is, if I use support during the day for a couple hours, is it helping or harming me long term? Uh, it's certainly not going to harm you long term by any stretch. Uh, it can certainly help if it allows you to rest and recuperate and um, uh, be, you know, uh, have the energy to, you know, uh, to do the things that you need to do. Uh, there is a, um, a way of ventilating during the day called SIP or mouthpiece ventilation, some people call it sip and puff ventilation, which is really on-demand um, ventilation um, done typically through a mouthpiece. If you have uh, uh, preserved upper extremity motion, patients will keep the mouthpiece on their lap. If you don't have 
upper extremity uh, motion or function, then the mouthpiece is typically mounted to an articulating iron position right next to the mouth. So the simple answer is you need to have the support that you need. And um, if there is no indication of respiratory insufficiency, in other words, you have a normal carbon dioxide level during the day, then there's really no need for ventilation. But it's, uh, um, uh, certainly if there is a need, then you definitely ought to, uh, to have access to it. And the final question, which is a really good one, is should oxygen be administered if ever? And the answer is yes, if you have um, a, a simple answer is if you, your oxygen level is low and it's not because of respiratory failure, then using oxygen is perfectly reasonable. However, if you have chronic respiratory insufficiency or chronic respiratory failure and a high carbon dioxide, which is one of the drives to breathe, and you have low oxygen, if you administer, administer supplemental oxygen um, uh, in somebody that has, low, uh, has a low oxygen level, um, in the face of respiratory failure, then there's the potential for removing um, the uh, low oxygen drive to breathe, which can then add further problems to uh, uh, you know, the uh, level of ventilation or carbon dioxide detention. So it's kind of, I liken that to saying if you have a fever, should you just take a Motrin or an, Ad, or, or an Advil? Um, uh, if you know what the fever is from, uh, then there's certainly no problem. But you wouldn't, by any stretch, just take Motrin and Advil for a fever without asking the question, well, where is it coming from? So I think oxygen is a perfectly safe and very important medication to use, but only if it's, um, it's just to correct low oxygen because of uh, that is the primary issue as opposed to uh, respiratory failure. I had a comment and then one question um, on pulmonary. Right. Regarding the signs of daytime ventilatory support, um, I think we all need to realize that we as the patient are not necessarily going to recognize those signs and that sometimes they come on very slowly over time and so we really need to depend on our family and loved ones around us to kind of start helping us monitor those changes. Um, people with CMD tend to be incredibly adaptable and so it's something that may be happening slowly enough that you don't even realize and you're just figuring out how to adapt to it from day to day. Um, but we really need you know, your family and, and loved ones to kind of help monitor whether or not those signs that Dr. Meyer mentioned, um, that indicate that maybe daytime ventilatory support may be necessary. Um, I do also want to address a question that kind of maybe sort of brought up in the beginning um, that didn't get asked specifically, but um, when should we start uh, looking for pulmonary surveillance and care? Like at what point and how often? Um, that's a good question. I mean, my bias would be as soon as there's a diagnosis to identify a pulmonologist that, when needed, can help provide support. Uh, sometimes that may not be for a number of years after diagnosis. Sometimes it may be fairly soon after diagnosis. And so I would always rather, I always, I have a very good rapport with my neurology colleagues and when I have a patient with a new diagnosis, I will see them uh, for an assessment and if there's something that needs to be addressed, then address it. If not, then um, make sure that um, uh, the patient and the family know how to uh, communicate with me and, and ex uh, express concerns about things changing in the wrong direction. Um, but I think it's very hard uh, uh, preclinically to set a um, uh, frequency for visits other than what I usually do, which is just an annual visit. Um, for our patients on chronic ventilation, we like to see them at least uh, two, if not three times a year. So I'll move on to orthopedics. Um, yes, uh, at what point is spine correction surgery recommended? Um, I would say one of the one of the criteria is the percentage of curve, definitely. But another particularity, one of the particularities of scoliosis in step and one related myopsy is that the dorsal spine, that is the part of the spine that is between the shoulder plates, tends to be lordotic, that is, tends to um, push forward 
and to reduce the diameter of the thorax and therefore the space that uh, lungs have to develop, to grow, and to breathe. So this is one important consideration. I think it's um, also another of the questions later on. What influence does scoliosis have on pulmonary function? Uh, one of the criteria is is the impact that the scoliosis is having on the respiratory function. In severe cases, the, the dorsal spine can push forward so much that it is collapsing uh, some of the uh, part of the, of the lungs. If this is the case, interventions should be, well, as, as quick as necessary, sometimes even before the end of growth. And uh, it, it it's important to find a, uh, an expert surgeon that can not also straighten the spine, uh, but also try in as much as possible to reduce this impact of the spine on the lung function. Uh, we have seen the odd patient that never required spinal surgery in the mildest, mildest cases in our series, but I would say this is less than 2% cases. In most cases, uh, surgeons tend to wait as much as possible uh, to allow for uh, growth. So they tend to wait until the age of around 13, between 11 and 13, depending on whether the patient is a boy or a girl. Um, and uh, unless there are reasons, and particularly from the respiratory point of view, uh, that need surgery to be performed sooner. The other criteria also is the evolution of the respiratory function. If your patient has a very low uh, respiratory capacity and, um, and you wait too much, there is a risk that uh, uh, lung growth uh, is, is worse and therefore the risks of surgery can be increased. So I would say wait until the end of the growth spur if possible unless the respiratory function or the severity of the scoliosis requires uh, interventions, intervention sooner. Can I add a little bit to that? Absolutely. Great. So this is Hank Meyer again. I um, have the opportunity to work with um, group of orthopedic surgeons that um, are doing um, uh, scoliosis surgery using what they call growth sparing procedures, which are now becoming fairly you know, widespread and popular, where the spine isn't necessarily fused, but is uh, uh, supported um, more lateral uh, than uh, a spinal rod would, would typically support the spine. And the advantage of this approach is that um, intermittently, usually once or twice a year, the surgeon can go in and in a fairly simple procedure expand the, um, uh, the, the, the support device. Um, and that's at least in more standard orthopedic spine surgery has allowed earlier intervention. Um, and I think that has a, a very exciting potential in their muscular disease in part because in many situations, once you lose respiratory function related to scoliosis, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to get it back. Um, and so I, I, I feel very strongly about um, taking as proactive an approach as possible, and the option of growth sparing surgery you know, really provides that as an option. I'd like to add that there is um, also specific physical therapy for scoliosis, known as trough physical therapy. I've had a number of who have benefited dramatically from this specific type of uh, physical therapy. And it should be fairly easy to kind of Google and find um, someone in your area that can provide that for you. Can I address the perioperative management issue? That's, uh, I guess, the second to last question there. Um, yep. I think that the single biggest um, uh, uh, factor that leads to prolonged recovery is inadequate airway clearance and lung recruitment after surgery. Um, and um, for any of, 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 of those on the, uh, the call who have had surgery, for those of us that have intact respiratory muscle strength, when the breathing tube is removed, 
uh, a a nurse or a respiratory therapist or a you know a physician will, will tell you to take a big deep breath and cough and, and they put an incentive spirometer by your bedside to encourage you to breathe deeply. That helps you re-recruit your lungs. Um, the problem obviously is that if you have a neuromuscular uh, condition um, and have narcotics and benzodiazepines on board from surgery, it's going to be very difficult to do that effectively. And so without traditional therapy with devices like the Cophesis to help you do that, the recovery time can be quite prolonged and in some situations can be uh, fairly rocky. And so uh, I think as long as there's recognition of the need for uh, assisted airway clearance and lung recruitment, and then also um, acknowledging the, uh, the, the need for um, non-invasive ventilation uh, as a bridge from uh, having a breathing tube in to being off of support completely. If there's a good acknowledgement of that, then um, the perioperative, the postoperative course should go along quite smoothly. Is it ever appropriate to consider bracing rather than surgery for scoliosis? Uh, it's a temporizing procedure. Um, there, there is the, the Garsh brace, which has been quite popular in SMA, um, that has the advantage of providing support sort of focused right underneath the, uh, uh, the, the the armpits and then over the hips, keeping the rib cage you know, fairly free. And I think one of the concerns in bracing in the conventional way is that you use pressure on the rib cage to correct uh, the, the spine alignment. Um, and if you have a weak rib cage um, uh, and you start pushing the ribs in, that can cause you to have chest wall distortion that can you know, add further to the respiratory difficulty. And so um, I think brace, bracing is still done in some situations, but I think um, many orthopedic surgeons are, are, are moving away from it. And even outside of neuromuscular disease, it's typically seen as a temporizing procedure that may give some correction, but not the same type of correction one gets with surgery. For the third question, are those diagnosed with rigid spine muscular dystrophy more likely to experience scoliosis and those diagnosed with multi-mini the, the answer is no. As I said, most patients will have uh, significant scoliosis, if not all of them, uh, and uh, uh, this is independent of the, of the microscopic aspect of the biopsy. Okay, now moving on to mobility, exercise, and physical therapy. What kind of exercise is safe versus exercise that can cause destruction of the muscle? I can comment a little bit to that. Um, so typically what we recommend is more um, isometric exercise because it doesn't aim to break the muscle like eccentric exercise does. It's eccentric being something like weightlifting where, for example, if you're doing a bicep curl, you are putting a weight against an extended muscle in an effort to break it and then rebuild it. Um, but general recommendations are that I give to patients, and of course, more work needs to be done on this to see how far we can push patients. But as a rule of thumb, typically um, what I recommend is swimming, which is one of the nicest forms of isometric exercise that you can do. And uh, additionally, I saw here, is it, is it okay to ride a stationary bike? Yes, I think biking is also very safe. You can do arm biking as well. And another rule of thumb that I have is if you're doing any kind of exercise that is distinctly causing muscle pain, that's probably an exercise to stay away from. Question, how frequently should I exercise? I'm a big fan of as much exercise as you can tolerate without causing yourself muscle pain. Um, I think too much is when you push yourself to the point of feeling pain the next day where you're immobilized. Um, so it should be a comfortable amount of exercise to kind of help you with range of motion and uh, import, improve your uh, cardiovascular function, so. and it also helps with your pulmonary stress. Does the type of exercise recommended depend on age or disease progression or disease state? You know, usually you're, if you're functionally limited, you can only do certain types of exercise, obviously. Uh, but again, you know, if you, uh, um, I would say whatever type of exercise that you are able to do, which falls into the realm of kind of being an isometric exercise and something that doesn't cause pain or muscle breakdown, um, 
the pain is more of a marker of you causing some muscle destruction, uh, you know, I would probably just recommend that. I don't think the type necessarily, uh, I would probably steer away from any kind of weightlifting if I were to kind of restrict anything. If I can add just a comment, um, sometimes patients who evolve um, or older patients, when they travel or for different, uh, because they have an intercurrent disease, they, when they stay, when they reduce the rate of exercise or stay mobilized for a few days or weeks, they find they lose uh, functional capacity. So um, definitely some degree of exercise that is, as just described, not harmful for your muscles, but this space to uh, man maintaining your muscle strength and in this condition like in other conditions um, immobility has an impact, a, ne a negative impact on uh, on the functional capacities of the patient. Okay, there's a question about uh, recommending yoga, massage or acupuncture. Well, I think there are no studies giving us figures as to how good or negative the effects of these techniques are. So uh, we tend to give recommendations that are more or less like the ones that NAS just um, defined. As long as uh, this fits with, uh, with your capacities, it's feasible, you feel comfortable, you don't uh, go beyond your own limits, uh, there's no reason why this should have a negative impact on the, the it could be rather positive. Typically, yoga exercises are uh, isometric and not eccentric. So massage can have a, a positive uh, effect also for patients who have uh, um, muscle pain and in particular um, spinal pain. Uh, and as for acupuncture, I have no experience at all, and I am not aware of any study looking at the effects of uh, acupuncture on this condition. But as for yoga and massage, uh, I, I would say yes, as long as uh, each patient uh, respects his or her own limits. I have no experience with acupuncture either. Okay, and the last three questions are about mobility. Uh, can we expect to maintain the ability to walk indefinitely? And at what point should we start using a wheelchair? And if we start using a wheelchair, can we expect a rapid respiratory decline? Well, I may comment on the third question because now we are following up the first patients who are going beyond the age of 60. This tends to be a pretty stable condition uh, during the patient's teens. And, and, and until the age of 30, 35, if the respiratory function is, is taken care of, if respiratory assistance is good and, and scoliosis management is good. So uh, most patients have an active life. Uh, many have a full-time job, and most of them are ambulant and pretty independent. After the age of 35, we tend to see a decline in the functional capacities, which is uh, probably due in part to the disease and, and, and most of it due to muscle aging, which starts quite early in life. Uh, so uh, we have said for a number of years that it, this was a stable condition. Uh, now we are seeing that with aging, there is a tendency to a decline. Uh, the patients who are beyond 60 uh, have a less good walking capacity than they had when they were 30. Uh, but there are, they are still uh, very few, so we cannot draw definite conclusions as to the prognosis, the lifelong prognosis for one individual patient. We cannot guarantee that the walking ability is going to be stable uh, throughout life, but this is true for most of the congenital muscle conditions, I would say. And as for at what point should I uh, start using a wheelchair, I would say it depends on the individual needs. When, uh, when the patient is falling and there's uh, an increased risk of fracture, 
when the patient can no longer uh, do in his or her life what he could do with a wheelchair, then uh, we recommend using a wheelchair when necessary. It can be for long trips, it can be for long distances outdoors. The, it doesn't need to be uh, a black or white decision. They can use it when they need it and that they can leave it when they do not need it anymore. And they can combine both for uh, quite a number of years usually. But it's not, there's no evidence that um, preventing yourself from using a wheelchair when it's needed, for instance, for going on holidays, for visiting places, for walking out, for, for being outdoors, uh, for, for having activity outdoors, is going to have any positive impact on evolution of the disease. And on the contrary, if falls are frequent, there can be an increased risk of fractures with ne negative consequences of the disease. So I would say you can use a wheelchair whenever the need for it is present. Dr. Meyer, the last question. So um, can I expect more rapid respiratory decline if I start using a wheelchair? And so that's actually a more complicated question than you might expect. Um, what we know is that if you stand and you do uh, lung function testing and then you sit and you do lung function testing, um, the volume of air that you can breathe out when you try as hard as you can goes down when you sit down. And that's in part because when your diaphragm contracts and goes downward, there's more resistance to uh, downward diaphragm motion. So your lung volume will go down just from sitting. So in neuromuscular disease, I think, um, the more simple answer is that you're, you have respiratory decline as you lose muscle function. And so the loss of skeletal muscle function that leads to uh, losing ambulation probably is reflected as much in loss of respiratory muscle function. And so I think it's probably two parallel processes with perhaps a small um, uh, added burden on breathing just from uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sitting as opposed to standing. Nutrition. We kind of addressed the question earlier about gaining weight, but maybe we could briefly cover that and then the rest of the questions. I think we, we just to summarize what we said earlier, um, if you have any kind of uh, um, respiratory failure, it sometimes does make it difficult to gain weight, but that might not be in the entirety of what's going on. And I think Dr. Uh, Ferro had mentioned that she's doing some research in terms of the metabolics of this condition. I can add that the inability to gain weight continues well into adulthood. Uh, for older patients, we see a tendency to gain weight after the age of 50, and it does not necessarily have a positive impact on, uh, on, on muscle function. So um, this leads me to the next um, question when considering a feeding tube. Um, I think this needs to be considered as in any other person when the nutritional state is not good, but not just because of low weight, because the normal, the standard reference weight for these patients is by no means the standard curves of weight for the standard population. Trying to reach a normal weight or to become close to the standard normal weight doesn't have a positive impact on muscle function and it often has forced feeding, often has a negative impact from the functional point of view because the muscles do not naturally become stronger. And if you have to carry four more kilos with the same weak muscles, uh, fatigue can be more important and it's uh, not necessarily easier. Uh, so I would say a feeding tube needs to be considered when the nutritional state of the patient is not good. And sometimes when a serious surgery is going to be considered, is, going, is being considered, the nutritional state is a concern for recovery and for healing. But not as a standard intervention and not just to bring the weight close to the standard curves for the general population. Do you recommend antioxidant diets and what vitamins or supplements are recommended? 
Um, for me, that I, I just looking at the list here, so I always recommend that everybody get a vitamin D level checked. Um, that's mainly because uh, you definitely want to supplement um, uh, to maintain your uh, bone strength and prevent fractures in the future. Uh, usually I'll recommend calcium along with that if I'm doing high, high dose supplementation with vitamin D um, if someone is found to be deficient. For creatine monohydrate, um, I don't typically recommend that unless someone is experiencing uh, muscle cramping. Um, and I, for this population of patients, I don't typically rec uh, I have not been recommending CoQ10 um, or a particular antioxidant diet, not because I don't think it's an interesting idea, but because uh, I haven't seen any research published on it and this type of work is very difficult to do because the diet is very difficult to control on a day-to-day -day basis. No, I agree. We do not have data and uh, the the problem with that long-term antioxidant diets is that they are not the totally de diets are devoid of negative effects, but uh, antioxidant supplements in the long term are not totally devoid of risk. So as long as we do not have specific studies with uh, any uh, intervention, I think there's no reason to recommend them. What I usually recommend is a healthy diet with a good um, intake of antioxidants, uh, fruits and vegetables, but that's probably true for anyone, with or without the myopathy. Other medical concerns. Is there a correlation between SEP and 1 and hearing loss? Several in our community have noted hearing loss or sound sensitivity. Well, not that, that I'm aware of, but if the community has noted this, maybe it would be interesting to try and look into this more in detail. And maybe the community can collect this information in a more organized way. I wonder if these are genetically confirmed cases because there is that uh, SECISPP2 mutation um, with the selenocysteine insertion. When binding protein that can sometimes present with hearing loss. Um, in the discussion on the Facebook group, I uh, kind of was monitoring two, two or three of the people that uh, responded affirmatively that this is an issue. I know are, are genetically confirmed for second one. So basically, we have no studies that indicate a correlation between hearing issues and second one. That's correct. No, that's correct. Is the heart affected in step in one and should heart function be monitored? If so, how often and in what way? So the, the heart tissue is not affected in step in one related myopathy, although it is a muscle and step in one is expressed in the heart muscle. Uh, the heart muscle functions well. The only heart concern that we have seen is a consequence of the respiratory failure when uh, the lungs are not working well. Your, left, uh, your right ventricle has to pump against increased resistance, and this can have an impact on the function and the size of the right ventricle. Usually this is reversible, and when the respiratory failure is treated and well taken care of, this usually goes back to normal. But we haven't seen a primary heart disease associated with 7-1 related myopathy. We still recommend monitoring every monitoring every two years, but it's more you know uh, to be sure that there is no uh, consequences of the respiratory failure, and uh, not expecting to find a primary heart disease. Has a correlation between SEP1 and nocturnal aneurysis been found or studied? Uh, well, some of our patients complain of uh, incontinence. That is a recurrent complaint both in females and in males. And this can be quite of a problem both during the day and during the night. Not particularly nocturnal enuresis. And this is probably related with weakness of the pelvic floor muscles. What should we, we be doing to inhibit Bone density loss, how often should we get a DEXA? What point is a biophosphonate 
to be initiated if ever. We recommend basal uh, DEXA when uh, patients start using a wheelchair. And uh, in most patients around the age of 35, 40. And then uh, it depends on the results. If there is osteoporosis, if there is loss of bone density, then uh, they start the usual protocol. Uh, typically one scan every two years, and depending on the results, uh, diphosphonates are indicated or not. What other concerns should my care team and I be concerned about related to the typical aging issues and uh, specifically CMD? Well, I think we, we already mentioned that um, muscle function tends to change with aging. Uh, we haven't seen a uh, number of patients enough to draw clear-cut conclusions about the effects of menopause, although, as I said, after the age of 50 and, and even more after, after the age of 60, uh, there is a progression of the disease and the impact, menopause can have an impact on that. We really need to see more patients growing older to conclude. As I said, heart disease is not expected, and there is no reason to have arthritis more than in any other patient, in any other person in the general population. And there is typically in seven one related myopathy patients um, altered response to uh, glucose overload tests, what we call insulin resistance, but we haven't seen. Um, patients becoming diabetic more than, again, in the general population. So insulin resistance tends to uh, persist during life, but none of our patients has developed diabetes requiring insulin or specific treatments. So I would say that uh, uh, the main concern with aging is the overlap of muscle aging and uh, the disease itself, and the impact this can have on, 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 on muscle function. Research. How is the NAC trial in France going? Will there be a similar trial in the United States, and will children be included in subsequent NAC studies? Well, I think this is definitely something that we need to discuss during the meeting next week, and um, um, I think I'll all forces available need to be uh, put together to make progress with this. For the night trial in France, uh, there are good news and less good news. Uh, there are five patients included. Everything is going fine with them. There is no negative effect. We don't know which one of them have started with the placebo, which one have started with the drug, but uh, none of them has reported negative or uh, side effects. Uh, the problem is that we have uh, met with unexpected funding issues. We are counting on complementary funding that we uh, haven't been able to get. So uh, the rhythm, the rate of inclusions is likely to be slowed down for a few months. Um, as to whether there will be a similar trial in the U.S., I think uh, this is something we definitely need to discuss. And as for children, we are uh, designing now um, a simplified trial, which will be a pilot with a small number of patients and with um, less demanding protocol. And again, uh, whether this should be a French trial or include other countries, I think this is an, a very open question and something that we, I hope we will discuss uh, in detail next week. Yeah, this is Alan Beggs, and I'll just expand a little bit on that with regards to the United States. Um, to, to echo what Anna just said, this is going to be, I think, a very important topic of discussion at our meeting in Washington in a couple of weeks. Uh, and she'll update us on the status of the trial in France. Uh, Dr. Katie Mellier at the National Institutes of Health, uh, also a colleague of NAS who's on the phone, has been running a similar trial for patients with ryanidine receptor mutations here in the United States. She will update us. And uh, there will also be a couple of uh, 
individuals and family members um, with CEP N1 who have been taking N acetylcysteine um, outside of a trial, and I, our hopes is that they'll also be able to tell us a little bit about their experiences. Uh, and just by way of um, to presage what one of the points we'll make there, it's obviously very interesting to hear about the experiences of individuals who uh, take supplements like N acetylcysteine uh, outside of a clinical trial. Um, on the other hand, it also makes it difficult to plan a trial. And so at the meeting in Washington, we'll kind of discuss the pros and cons of this and whether or not uh, we have a sufficient um, population here in the U.S. to really plan something. Uh, and certainly um, want to discuss ways that we can coordinate among all the investigators and families around the world. Is anyone looking at the use of Indaravone? I think I'm pronouncing that correctly in step in one. No, not, not for step in one, but it was recently approved for ALS, but that's pretty much hmm. all I've heard. So this is a drug that is a neuroprotective agent. It's used um, often for aiding neurological recovery following uh, an acute brain ischemia, so lack of oxygen to the brain. It's actually, uh, in its current formulation, provided intravenously. And so it's not something that I think anyone has considered for the use of CEPN1 myopathy. Uh, but because it belongs to the general class of agents that act um, as an antioxidant, it's something that you might consider. Uh, again, in Washington, we're going to discuss some of the recent data that Bezad touched on regarding the function of CEPN1, uh, namely that it tends to serve as a reducing agent for the circuit channel. And so any drug that has uh, that type of antioxidant activity, that has a reducing activity, uh, theoretically might be something that could be beneficial. And that's why uh, I think this question is one worth considering. I can follow up on that. Uh, actually, all these antioxidants have a very general antioxidant effect. And based on what we know about the biology of uh, second one, the way it interacts with circa inside the cytoplasmic reticulum, and it counterbalances uh, this protein called ARO1 that uh, overoxidizes uh, the reticulum in the absence of second one. We are also considering inhibitors of ARO1 as an alternative uh, possibility to of therapy. Right. So, in effect, if you consider that the circuit channel is just one protein in the cell out of hundreds of thousands, it's like a it's a pen, and using an antioxidant therapy that affects all the proteins is kind of hitting that pin with a sledgehammer. And what Bezad is referring to would be a much more targeted approach potentially. And I should say this is all very recent. So these are concepts that we have about potential therapies, um, and they're the types of things that we need to discuss as a research community to decide how best to uh, test these ideas out and hopefully eventually translate that towards a clinical trial. Um, I can uh, touch on um, stem cell therapy for a moment, since I see that's and CRISPR-Cas. So those are the next two questions. Um, both of these are approaches that are, have been considered in various contexts for the treatment of uh, neuromuscular disease. Stem cell therapy involves taking muscle from a normal individual or maybe taking it from somebody with a muscle disease and correcting the cells in the dish and then doing an injection of the individual cells back into the muscles and hoping that they will repopulate the muscle and hopefully restore function by its effect. Conceptually, it's like doing a transplant, like a heart transplant or a liver transplant by doing it at the level of individual cells. On a practical level, stem cell therapy, uh, we can get it to work in a mouse if we do things to those mouse that you'd never do to a human. For example, giving it so much extra radiation that it destroys the existing muscle and triggers regeneration. These are not things we would do in a clinical setting. And um, it's been very, the logistics have been impossible to really get sufficient uh, transplantation throughout all the muscles in somebody's body to, to work clinically, uh, although it is an area that continues to be under active investigation in general. CRISPR-Cas, just to touch quickly on it, is a new method 
for targeting a particular genetic location in our DNA uh, with the potential to actually change it in a way that we can predict, so-called genetic engineering. Uh, and it's a much more efficient way than has existed until now uh, to make a specific change. So there's the hope and the promise that it could be used as a way to reverse or correct the, a particular mutation. Again, there are a lot of logistical issues that's being studied um, for muscular dystrophy and for some other conditions. It's something that has a lot of promise, but again, is not ready for prime time. Uh, my thought is that uh, we're waiting for technical advances uh, that would increase the efficiency and the targeting of CRISPR-Cas. Whenever we alter DNA sequences, we always have to be very cautious that we don't inadvertently alter some other random sequence, a so-called off-target effect that very occasionally could lead to cancerous transformation of the cells. Um, so there are risks associated with this. Again, though it's an area under very active investigation, maybe at some point in the future it could be uh, used for SEPIN1 myopathy, um, but probably not in the short term. Um, and uh, that kind of addresses the next question about treatments being tested for other neuromuscular conditions. Um, and in general, um, as we understand more, I mean, one of the things that's very important is to know the basis for the weakness. Now that we know the basis for step N1 myopathy has to do with the calcium not being taken up in, back into the sarcopathic reticulum as efficiently as it should, we can think about other various drugs or uh, therapeutic maneuvers that could target that. Um, as Dr. Meyer was saying, as we understand the basis for the pulmonary weakness, we can certainly come up with treatments that are more effective than what we have. Um, same for the orthopedic interventions. Uh, and so in general, understanding the patterns of weakness. Um, as Naz mentioned, when you do MRI, we can see specific patterns of muscle weakness. Knowing that, we can potentially target therapies, particular muscles. Uh, and so these are all just very general um, thoughts about how n understanding the basic biology and the natural history of this condition are very important. Um, as for carriers, I'll let others comment in a minute, um, but I'm not aware specifically of studies like that, but in, in natural history studies like the CMDIR uh, and in my labs and others, uh, we're always asking questions about the parents to kind of identify whether or not a carrier might have symptoms, uh, and I'm not aware of such. Um, somebody was about to say something. Was that you, Rachel? Yeah, I wanted to talk about quickly around the stem cell therapy question. I want to make it clear that there are currently no stem cell treatments, and, by no, and there's no reason why anybody should be going to other countries that are allowing these things um, to go get stem cell injections. They're incredibly dangerous and COVID life-threatening. Yes, thank you. That's a very important point. There are plenty of stem cell treatments you can find on the Internet, and you're taking your life in your hands as well as throwing your money away if you do any of them at this point. They are not controlled trials. They're not done um, oftentimes under very safe situations. Um, but rest assured, there are plenty of reputable scientists and physicians who are considering it, and you'll certainly know if and when any safe and effective therapy became available. So um, Anna or Naz, or would you like to comment on what our expectations should be for the next 10 years? Uh, sure. I mean, um, I think uh, at least I could speak to the U.S. side. You know, uh, I have a lot of interest, and I know others um, that are involved in studying step in one have a, and treating patients with congenital myopathies are very interested in um, you know, supporting a natural history sty uh, study, and then hopefully once, once a natural history study is established with uh, effective outcome measures and goals, uh, initiating a trial. Um, and, uh, you know, I myself can speak for myself. I would be more than happy to work with Dr. Ferrero, providing patients and assessments and whatever is necessary to uh, make this happen on a, uh, at least, uh, between our two countries and hopefully with patients coming from uh, coming in from other countries as well. Can you explain uh, why an epigenetic study is necessary? 
Uh, sure, because if you don't know what the natural course of the disease is, you don't know what therapy you're implementing is actually effective, whether or not you're, the therapy that you're implementing is effective or not. Yeah, and this is particularly important for a lot of myopathies because, as we discussed earlier, there can be quite a bit of variation from one individual to another. So we need to kind of understand the basis for that. Um, and part of that comes with correlating the particular genetic mutation together so we can predict who might have been more uh, weaker than somebody else. Um, but unless we can understand that, we cannot identify whether or not a particular treatment is effective. Uh, and so this is really, I think, one of the major goals of the CMDIR. It's also the goal of research studies like mine and uh, like ones done in France. And I encourage everybody to enroll early and enroll often. There's nothing about one study that should preclude your involvement in another. Um, the CMDIR is a registry. It allows um, folks to be, stay in contact. It also involves a lot of data collection. Um, work that we do focuses a little bit more on the genetics. It's, so my point is that it's all very complementary. Uh, and as long as um, you have the capacity and the interest to be involved, uh, it's really critical because without all of us working together, uh, we can't make this kind of progress. Um, yes, I would like to comment uh, a bit on, on uh, the expectation for clinical trial readiness. One of the goals of uh, the clinical trial in France was assessing the effect of NAC on this condition, but the other goal was validating outcomes, that is, uh, parameters that we can measure, that we can f put figures on, and therefore that we can use to measure the impact of any treatment. And this is a major step for clinical trial readiness. We are learning a lot. And, um, and also we're working in my lab to, with, uh, with the mouse model of the disease, but also with patient cells, cultured cells to validate biomarkers that we can use to measure the impact of NAC treatment, but also of any other treatment in the future. So I expect that in the next 10 years, we um, may make significant steps to improve clinical trial readiness in this condition. And that's what can the community do to help push, push research well, uh, as a very earthly comment, I think, uh, help in raising awareness and raising funds for uh, funding uh, clinical trials, but also for funding natural history studies and also for um, increasing the interest of the drug companies in, in this kind of work, this is, uh, would be uh, very, very important. Yeah, we'll touch on this topic uh, at the meeting in Washington. We'll have representatives from two companies that are going to be there to tell us about their experiences developing therapies for rare disease like this. And just on a legislative front, I'll touch on Anna's last comment. Um, uh, she was referring to the practice of what's so-called repurposing, where um, a scientist or, or, uh, might identify an existing safe and, and licensed or approved drug um, might identify that it's useful for some new disease that it hadn't previously been tested for. And the problem is that there's uh, very little financial incentive for companies to uh, develop these drugs because they don't have any protection that would allow them to sell 
the drug uh, in a way that they can make back their investment. Uh, one of the, um, there's a piece of legislation that's been pending here in the United States called the OPEN Act, O-P-E-N, which is designed specifically to address this, which would give a company six months of ability to sell a drug without competition for the purpose of a new use if they can prove that that new use is both safe and effective. Um, and so this is the type of thing that people are thinking about to try to incentivize, provide the necessary business environment that would allow the companies to invest in these very rare diseases. Because as you all know, there are not that many individuals out there with sep one when you compare it to things like heart disease or cancer. And so there, um, we need to convince the drug companies that it, um, they have the proper incentives in place to make the investments to help us do all the studies that are necessary. One question uh, earlier about NAC. Would you be able to recommend people using NAC on their own as it is an over-the-counter availability? Or would you recommend that they not use it until its trial is concluded? As long as we do not have data on the mean and long-term effect of the drug in this condition, it's difficult. We cannot recommend it, actually. Uh, that that was one of the goals of the clinical trial, to have figures to assess the long-term uh, effects, effectiveness and effects on this disease, on this indication. This being said, is it's a reasonably safe drug. And the only caveat would be that, at least in France, it's counterindicated in babies and infants with uh, uh, calf uh, difficulties because it can increase the volume of um, lung secretions and therefore it can lead to further uh, difficulties for coughing in case of a respiratory infection. Aside from this caveat, uh, it's a reasonably safe um, drug. So um, while I understand people who are taking it uh, without being included in a clinical trial, I think uh, we cannot, there is no, we have no data allowing us to recommend its use in this condition so far. Bizar, did you want to comment on the uh, question that Alan had in the chat about EN460, QM295, and Eroxidin? Uh, well, uh, basically, as Alan said, <laughs> uh, antioxidants Sorry. that might affect a bunch of other uh, Function the cell, anything that could affect uh, more specifically uh, the function of a re replace kind of a compensate a certain one would work better. In this case, there was a publication showing that uh, EN460, uh, which is an inhibitor of ERO1, simply in vitro to kind of compensate uh, for the absence of certain one by reducing the, uh, the activity of ERO1 and as a result reducing the, oxida the oxidation in the reticular. But we need more uh, study obviously in the in cultures and also in animal models before we can, uh, we can move it to, to patients, I think. Dr. Esther Zito is a uh, molecular biologist in Italy. Uh, she is the person who made this discovery and has published a few papers on it. She will be at the meeting in Washington, D.C. Um, following up on what, what, is, what can we as a community do now to help push research toward clinical trials? There are several opportunities, obviously. Registering with the Congenital Muscle Disease International Registry, GMBIR. I think most of you are already registered, but there are several on the one Facebook who are not. Um, it helps us sort of understand prevalence. It helps us understand a little bit about natural history. Um, how is the disease affecting you? Um, at what age was onset? What is your genetic mutation? Those are all important questions to start moving in the direction of clinical trials. Registering with a BEGS lab as well as participating in clinical trials um, that, as they become available. Um, donating existing muscle biopsy tissue that may be sitting in a freezer at your local uh, institution to our CMB tissue repository is also another really excellent way um, to contribute to science. Um, and all of these, these pieces are kind of working together. Um, all of our goal is to figure out a way to push toward clinical trials for step one. We do realize that it is further behind than some of the other CMV subtypes, but there's a lot of potential there. Um, and community involvement 
because it is such a tiny community. It is really paramount um, getting everybody involved um, and aware and, and participating in, in any and all of these opportunities will really kind of catalyze our ability to move things forward. So that is it for today. We thank you so much for your really, really excellent questions. Um, we're, we're really thrilled by the level of, of engagement and the level of what seems like a, kind of an awareness of what's going on already, and it's really fantastic. Um, if you have any additional questions, please get in touch by email. This email comes directly to me, info at kirstindy.org. Um, I will point you in the direction of someone who can answer your question if I'm not able to. And in the meantime, please stay engaged. Thank you so much to our host today. We will have another webinar following the Step in One meeting in next week in Washington, D.C. And then again, I hope to see everybody at the July meeting uh, for CMB SciFam. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you, Rachel, for doing thank such you. a wonderful job of organizing. Great. Happy to. Take care, everyone. <laughs>